Welcome to The Dirt on the Past, a program of the Extreme History Project that explores the good, the bad, and the ugly about our human past. Because, let's face it, Crystal. Yep, history is not pretty, but it is so important to know. Because it is the very thing that has led us to the most critical concerns that we have in the present. So join me, Nancy Mahoney. And me, Crystal Alegria. As we talk to archaeologists and historians who have been digging in the dirt. And in the archives. To uncover the fascinating histories that are not only relevant to today's issues. But help us move forward in a better way with a deeper understanding of our past. Hey, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of the show. I'm Nancy. And I'm Crystal. And we're co-hosts of The Dirt on the Past. This week, we are at KGLT Studios, and we'll be talking about the Montana Archaeological Society meetings here in Bozeman that happened last weekend. Yes, and we're so excited because the Montana Archaeological Society, which we'll probably refer to as MAS, MAS, um, is sponsoring the podcast episode today. Yay, MAS! Yay! And I'm just going to tell you a little bit about... um, a little bit about MAS, but then Nancy's going to do a deeper dive into the history of MAS. So so the Montana Archaeological Society was organized in 1958, and membership in the society is open to both amateur archaeolog- archaeologists and professional archaeologists. And this organization has a board of directors and publishes a really, really wonderful journal called Archaeology in Montana. And there's an annual meeting each year where board members, professional archaeologists, and amateur archaeologists come together to learn about what is happening archaeologically in the state through paper presentations and just talking to one another, kind of networking. Right. So, Nancy, can you do that deeper dive and tell us a little more about the history of the Montana Archaeological Society? I will dive in and tell a little bit more. We won't go crazy with that. There's been some wonderful published research on the history of MAS and just the history of archaeology in Montana in the journal by the same name. And when I started doing research into the period in which the Works Progress Administration was funding the first archaeological field work here in Montana, which happened in 1936, 1937, all the way th- up until really the beginning of World War II when the U.S. entered in 1942, I wanted to understand from that period what happened after that first project, which centered mainly around Pictograph Cave. What happened after that? Were there archaeologists in the States? So I started getting really interested because there were definitely published accounts in newspapers where we talk about um, or we see rather amateur or avocational archaeologists, people yeah. interested, going out and collecting. Now, some people were collecting bucketfuls from Um, bison kill sites, things at the time that in the 20s and 30s people didn't understand all that much about. They just kind of knew they were a resource on the landscape, either using the bones that could be turned into fertilizer um, and then finding the arrow points sort of along the way. But we really had our first archaeologists with training out here in 1940 with William Malloy coming on the WPA project. After he then was drafted into World War II and served, that project ended. And it was only in about 1948 that Carling Maloof was then hired at the University of Montana. Until then, there really wasn't any trained archaeologists in Montana. And Carling Maloof right away up in Missoula started talking to local people all throughout the area to find out where are the sites, what kind of sites, what do people know, what collections. And he trained a whole bunch of avocationals, and they gave papers. So they were busy doing that. And meanwhile, down in the Billings area, that was the area where Pictograph Cave was. And so many people had remembered all the WPA projects. So in the 1950s, a very smart interested bunch of professionals in other disciplines, whether it was law or engineering, Stu Connor and and a whole bunch of other friends would go out and find sites and do what they could to right away to learn from professionals, get what information they could and start recording sites. So out of that developed there the Billings Archaeological Society. 
Carling Maloof was still working with a whole bunch of people and doing what he could around the Missoula area. But then up near Haver, there was also the Milk River Archaeological Society. And we know Mm. wonderful people like Ann Johnson, who was just honored at this last MAS meeting, really got her start there. Um, Les Davis was involved there, Richard Forbes, all kinds of people, Emmett Stalkop, all people who were avocationals their whole life, but who really contributed a lot to our knowledge. And there's an amazing site up there, Wapachugan. I think I'm saying that probably wrong. I think that's maybe close. right. Okay, we'll go with that. <laughs> yeah. We'll go with that. It's open to the public and yeah. it's it's oddly it's behind a mini mall now. Yeah. So you think you're driving to the wrong place, but you're not. And then when you get onto the site, they even have little golf carts if you need assistance getting down because you're going down towards the Milk River and there is a bison kill site that was used for years and years and years. I mean, I think over millennia and they have preserved open um, profiles from the original excavations. So it's a really remarkable place. So anyway, all of those folks in those societies became interested in starting a state organization. A lot of other states in the West and all throughout the Midwest and East, out in California, Oregon, lots of other places, already had state organizations. A lot of them had state archaeologists and often more universities in their um, state that had already hired archaeologists that were doing research. So they had academics and then they had people funded by the state. So MAS really in 1958, they just started a meeting to kind of see what interest there was. So Oscar yeah. Lewis, the man that I studied in Billings, yeah. is on the handwritten records that are on the Montana Montana Historical Society um, as having shown up. Wow. And they started with just these interested people far flung. And that began the first meetings. And they tried okay. to move them all around and maintain separate chapters. But over time, they formed a more formal journal. And it was a labor of love for a lot of people because trying to put together a journal, yeah. hold meetings every week. But it was very much a collaboration between local people that were just interested, that were collecting, mm-hmm. that were finding sites maybe on their land and ranches, and um, the few people who actually had professional training in the discipline of archaeology. So it's changed a lot since then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it sure yeah. has. So so it was people kind of coming together around a shared interest and um, collecting at these sites, but then also really documenting them as well. So a lot of, um, of course, there was a lot There was probably a lot of non-documentation, but there was a lot of documentation. So we do have some information from these early days. And, of course, if you want to learn more about those early days, listen to our podcast with you, Nancy, that we did maybe a year or two ago about that, Um, kind of the history of the Archaeological Society. You go more into depth into archaeology in Montana. And then we just did a podcast with Tim Urbaniak about the history and archaeology of Pictograph Cave, kind of the the archaeology. Archaeologists at Pictograph Cave. Right. So, um, so if you want to learn more, check out those two podcasts. But it's it's a really important organization for us today because um, as avocational archaeologists, as people just interested in archaeology and professional archaeologists, it's a place to be connected to where you can meet once a year. Um, we ha- only have a meeting once a year, but you can come together once a year and really talk about what work you're doing if you're a professional archaeologist, what research you're up to. And, and then for avocational archaeologists, they can learn about these this these really interesting research projects, but also get involved in them sometimes as well through the Montana Archaeological Society because they do a lot of work around connecting avocationals with professionals. Right. And a lot of the people who show up now are archaeologists that are employed by the Forest Service, by the Bureau of Land Management, by those agencies that that work for the federal government, as well as for state parks, fish, yeah. wildlife, and park, and those. But then there's also, at both University of Montana and Montana State University, we have archaeologists at both places who do ongoing research and also have graduate students. And a lot of those archaeologists work in Montana, so they show up and they're graduate students. But there are often people who've showed up every year for decades. And I think we also saw a little bit of a movement in this meeting, the first one after COVID, because we haven't met for three years, to 
really open the doors again and try to be more welcoming to yeah. avocationals all over and to make people feel welcome to come, to learn, to bring their questions, maybe to bring collections that they've had in their family or that they've made themselves. We'd love to do more workshops about documentation, about how you curate these things, and then about how just to record information um, so that archaeologists have a better sense of what sites, where they are dating to certain time periods, just so we understand the prehistory better and the right. history. Yeah. Right, because the information is what is important to archaeologists doing this research. Um, they're, they're interested in their projectile points, not for the physical projectile point, but for the information that it tells us. Right. So that's where the avocational and the professional can come together because a lot of avocational archaeologists or people interested in archaeology have a lot of knowledge and they are private landowners and have projectile points and other artifacts on their land. And they know exactly where those artifacts came from. They can tell you exactly on their piece of property where they found this arrowhead, this projectile point. And so connecting with an archaeologist, then that archaeologist can get the information from that and then put it into their systems, you know, if they're a, a federal archaeologist or a state archaeologist. And that transfer of information is what, what is really, really important. So um, so that's what I really love. So we're, we're today on the podcast, we're going to just kind of talk about this latest coming together at the Montana Archaeological Society meetings that happened just this past weekend for us um, here in Bozeman. Montana. So the annual meeting kind of moves around every year. And this year, it just happened to be in Bozeman, which is really nice because um, we're in Bozeman. It was easy for us. It was easy yes. for us. But um, we're just going to kind of talk through the some of the presentations, not all of them, of course, but just talk through some that really piqued our interest and then talk about some of the awards that were given. And, and Nancy and I actually also did a presentation uh, on this podcast at the conference. So we'll talk yes, a little bit did. about that. But yes. before we dive into that, Nancy, I just wanted to say that, you know, the Montana Archaeological Society is really near and dear to my heart because when I was an undergraduate student here at Montana State University in the anthropology department, I went to my first MAS meeting all those years ago, back in the 1990s, <laughs> dating myself. And it was a really important experience for me because as an undergraduate student, it was a huge opportunity to meet archaeologists working in the field and to talk to archaeologists who are doing research about their research and then to meet other students and, and the professionals who are doing the work that I really wanted to do when I grew up, you know, the work that I wanted to have a career in. And so those early MAS meetings, I met people I still work with and I still am colleagues with and so and people I ultimately worked for eventually in the field. So I think for um, for these meetings are really important for professionals, they're really important for avocationals, but they're really important for students. And this organization, the Montana Archaeological Society, is small enough where if you go to a meeting, you're going to meet almost everyone there. You know, there's probably 150, 200 people at these meetings. So it's not like going to the Society for American Archaeology, which is sometimes overwhelming with the number of people that attend those meetings. And it's hard to have that one-on-one -on -one conversation. So for students, this is a really, really important meeting. So I know, Nancy, when um, you and I have both really... Um, really tried to get students to these meetings over the years and have been very successful. Yes, and when they give their own presentations, I think people are very generous yeah. with that, whether it's a poster or a paper. And then it opens the door to them to having conversations with people who have done lots more research in their area of interest. And it's a mm -hmm. nice way to get your foot in the door and to understand the field and figure out if this is something you want to do as a career either start working for a cultural resource management company where you get hired maybe right out of college yeah. with a job, or if you want to do that and then maybe go on to graduate school, getting a master's or maybe even a PhD. So there's all those different ways that undergraduates can actually become archaeologists and, and have a career. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, some of the, the people who are presenting at the conference this year have been 
students of yours who are now professionals. They have their PhDs. They're working in the field as professionals. So what that must be really gratifying to you, Nancy, to see um, some of your students now working as professionals in this field. It is. Doing amazing research. It is. Um, I mean, Emily Askey and Tristan Huxtable are right now doing field work. Neither of them have gone back to school yet to get a master's, although we keep encouraging them and it seems on the horizon, but they are working for CRM firms and they are doing archaeology on the ground. So they yeah. are going out and doing surveys and they're writing up reports, they're analyzing artifacts. So that's very exciting to see. And then other students like um, Emily Mike is just finishing up her master's. Marv Nelson is finishing up his master's, both at U of M. And then Scott Durst and Sari Dursum, yeah. who are married. I knew them before they were married when they were <laughs> undergraduates. Yes. That's insane. Scott yeah. finished his PhD. Sari has her master's. And they do this amazing high-altitude work. And um, it's phenomenal to see what they've both accomplished and, and where they are now and what contributions they're making, right. you know, to Montana archaeology. Yeah. Right. And we can just, you want to just start off by talking about Scott and Sari's paper that, that Scott presented at the Archaeological Society meeting? Absolutely. Why okay. don't you read the title and then All I'll right. dive in after that. Okay. So um, Scott Dursum kicked off the paper presentations. Um, this was a paper that was written by Scott and Sari Dursum. And, but Scott was the only one who got up. Sari, Sari um, was in the crowd sitting next to us, actually. But the title of the presentation is Early Paleo-Indian Mountain Use, Initial Reports from Ongoing Investigations at Two Clovis Sites in the Beartooth Mountains, Montana. So... This is unbelievably exciting. So we've talked before about alpine high-altitude archaeology in Montana and in the Beartooths, and that there has been a lot of ice patch research that Craig Lee and others yeah. have done. And Craig's the one we know best because he's right here in Bozeman, works for Metcalf, and now also teaches at uh, Montana State University. And so that research has been amazing, finding what has been eroding out of the ice patches as they melt now that we're seeing some warming temperatures up there. So we're seeing sheep corrals come out of that. So we're seeing a lot of um, biological materials, but then we're also finding artifacts. And so there's been, um, I think, part of an atlatl, and there's been a coiled basket. There's been some really amazing things showing us that people have been using these high altitude areas and then also showing us a bit about the environment and the ecosystem that was probably different 10,000, 12,000 years ago where we were having a tree line at a higher altitude. So there were trees up higher and it could have been that the resources that were available two people were different. So we were starting to get all that information, but I knew Scott Dursum and Sari Dursum had been up having a project up in the Beartooths and, and finding some sites, and I would yeah. hear bits and pieces. Yeah, I tried a couple times to get in there with Ian, my husband, <laughs> yeah. and we were never able to make it work time-wise. Yeah. But And I knew they were way deep in. So if you yeah. couldn't go in and hike in with them, they were miles in yeah. in these and alpine trees. Really high altitude. And just in. And and honestly, yeah. you know, I might just be too old to be able to <laughs> no. know. So, <laughs> this but, is a, a young person's game. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, we just were, were always anxious to hear when he'd come yeah. out of the field. And so this was really thrilling because he's pulled it all together for his dissertation. And what he's finding is that there are these sites that are Clovis era. So this is one of those really, really early periods. So we're talking 12,000 years ago. We're talking um, people who were not the first to enter the continent, not the first Americans necessarily, because we keep pushing back those yeah, dates. Yeah. But this is still very early. There are still glaciers that are covering huge parts of North America, most of Canada, and we're just seeing the opening of that ice free corridor, and populations have definitely come down and moved inland. But here they are, up at the, the tops of this mountain range. This is pretty much the highest range in Montana. And Scott is finding that the use of these ecosystems are 
much different than what had been theorized originally. So people are having camps there, and they're doing it in what seems to be corridors where you would find animals moving through, but also where you'd find a lot of other plant resources. Mm -hmm. So they seem to be areas where people are staying longer. I think what his research has shown is that initially people thought that there would be forays up to high altitude yeah. in order to gather plants kind or of temporary hunt just, animals. Just right. Not quickly, necessarily be staying for a whole season. Right. Except we know there's some eastern Shoshone and some Salish in some places that stayed up and People have referred to those groups as sheep eaters and things like that and corralling bighorn sheep and that that was a very dedicated subsistence. Well, he's finding as far back in the Clovis era that we're seeing people going after um, chert resources up there, that they might be using alpine lakes. They could be hunting geese. They're definitely going after sheep. They don't seem to be going after um, elk. But this is a time period where there are mammoth in Montana. Yeah, okay, right. so they're woolly mammoth. And when we think of Clovis hunters hunting big, big game, what Scott is showing is that there are people spending significant amount of time, probably several months, a big chunk of a season, up in the Beartooth range, and they are utilizing a wide range of resources in that ecosystem and settling down. They're making tools. He's finding yeah. debris. And there's lots of these end scrapers and things that we associate with cleaning hides yeah. and doing yeah. other things. So it's not just the men going up to hunt or the women making a foray with a basket to gather some things and some berries and come down. It seems yeah. really more that it's a whole group of people. And they're going to places where they know there are stone resources, water resources, animals resources and plant resources. And just and, living up there long, more long term than we originally thought. Absolutely. And so I'm, I'm doing a disservice to all the amazing data that he collected yeah. and, and analyzed um, because he's found Clovis points that are undeniably so and unbroken. And from what he mm -hmm. told us, National Geographic and the BBC and all of these other News organizations are so thrilled with this information that they're actually going to be coming down here this summer, hoping oh, to wonderful. get to these sites and oh, getting that information out to the public. Yeah. So we got a little sneak peek there yeah. from a little overview of his dissertation. And I think Sari, whose expertise is really in a lot of the flora, she's really looking at what plants would have been available, what the caloric... Um, ability of those plants to to help people or things that might have been, I'm butchering this a little bit, but not only what calories that those plant resources could provide, but were there also other specific plants that might have been utilized for women who were in childbirth, other mm. things like that. So there was lots of um, questions that even came out of this for future research. So that's, that's very wonderful. exciting. Yeah. And we hope, hope to have Scott and Sari on the podcast to talk more about the research as time goes on. So listen for that one, because that'll be a good one. So let's, let's move on, Nancy, and talk a little bit more about another, um, I wouldn't say a panel, but a grouping of presentations that really talked about drive lines. So do you want to kind of kick us off and start talking a little bit about um, the three people. Well, maybe I'll just kind of give an overview of who talked about these the, the drive lines and the cairns. Yeah, maybe the names and yeah. some titles, and then yeah. we'll go from there. So the there was three paper presentations, one that was presented by Jack Fisher. And we have had Jack Fisher on the podcast before. So if you want to learn a little bit more about his research, you can go back and in our episodes and listen to that. But in this presentation, Jack was talking about historical, social, and seasonal dimensions of communal bison procurement at the Emigrant Bison Kill Complex and elsewhere in Paradise Valley. And Paradise Valley is located right here um, in Montana, about 40 miles, 50 miles from Bozeman. So it's So where Livingston close. is all the way down to the Gardner entrance to Yellowstone Park. And that's where... 
the show Yellowstone yes, is supposedly set. That's right. right. Paradise oh, yes. Valley. You Good got it. connection there. Yeah. And so Jack presented first, and we'll talk a little bit about his presentation. But the second presentation in this grouping was by Walt Allen, Clayton Marlowe, and Jack Fisher as well worked on this presentation or on this paper. And the title of that one was Investigating Why Bison Jumps Work, a Case Study in Paradise Valley. And then the third component of this was a presentation by Scott Carpenter, and his title was Driving Questions, an Analytical Data Approach to Documentation and Interpretation of the Emigrant Bison and Game Drives. So all of three of these presentations kind of worked together to give us more background knowledge on how drive lines were used here in Paradise Valley, especially at a bison jump site called our bison kill site called Emig- em- the Emigrant Bison Kill. So Nancy, do you want to talk a little bit more about uh, kind of an overview of these three papers? I see the burden keeps falling to me to talk about the archaeology, so I will do so, my you're best. So, you're so good at it. <laughs> oh, don't flatter me. So Jack Fisher's presentation, my takeaway from that was he was really looking at what we know about female bison, especially also male bison, but male and female and how their fat stores on their bodies change throughout the year. So depending on whether they have just given birth, their fat resources are at a low and they're lactating, they're feeding their offspring, and they've come out of a hard winter because that's happening in the spring. And then as they go through the summer and there's all these lush grasses and they're moving into these great territories, they're fattening up as they're going into fall. So I think their peak is like October or November. And that's really the the prime time that you would want to be hunting bison. And this is something we know biologically from studies, but also I think there's a a lot of good ethnographic and ethnohistoric research on talking to Native people in the area and the tribes and when those hunts would be. So that would be where you'd want to get what they would call – these nursery herds where it would be mostly because at at some of that time until the rut of the males when they are wanting to mate again um a lot of the the female bison would be in herds with their offspring from just that year and then maybe some juvenile male and females that maybe haven't reached um maturity yet and so those would be probably herds that would be targeted by people hunting them um Males will show up again around the rut. That's not exactly the best time because they are low in fat to hunt them. They would be maybe fatter in in uh, um, other parts of the year, probably in midsummer. But um, I I think Jack's paper was giving us sort of that overview and what yeah. people would have known about that. Is there anything yeah. I'm missing well, from Jack's paper? Yeah. Well, I just wanted to follow up and. He, he talked a little bit about the Crow oral history, the Absalaga oral history that was given by Joe Medicine Crow in some of his uh, literature that he's, he wrote and some of the oral histories that were recorded of Joe Medicine Crow. And so there was a lot of oral history of this time period with the emigrant bison kill site. And so Jack talked a lot about that, which I'm, I'm really glad he included that in there. And then also, um, you know, kind of moving on to the Walt Allen presentation, he ta- they really, you know, worked, they've been working with wildlife biologists who are experts at bison migration and bison movement and also these seasonalities of the year where bison um, have these nursery herds and where they would be moving right. with those nursery herds. And I thought that was so interesting. And so they're really kind of working with a lot of different fields to better understand bison in general and how bison move on the ground in this valley today, right. which really f- reflects on how bison were moving in this valley for the last 10,000 years, you know? So they have been moving in the, well, maybe not 10,000 years, but <laughs> but for many thousands of years, uh, these bison herds have been in this valley. And so that really reflects the archeology span of these sites that we're seeing, these bison jump sites. And maybe, Nancy, you could just talk a little bit about the drive lines that they've been seeing on the ground. And that kind of moves us to Scott Carpenter's presentation because he really focused on the drive lines 
and and maybe you could talk about what a drive line is and the cairns associated with the drive lines and then why those are there and what they're seeing what kind of patterning they're seeing with these drive lines that this this data that they're gathering from wildlife biologists is really reinforcing well I would say with Walt's paper, before we leave that, what was fascinating to me was getting a better understanding of how the bison move between Yellowstone and then outside of Yellowstone and up into Paradise Valley further. So you you have the Lamar Valley, which is a great place to be in um, the spring when all the snows melt. And that's what everybody knows. That's where you go. You're going to see these herds of bison. To be able to see some bison in there. Right. But there's then other places. So they're moving to different elevations. They're moving to different places depending on the time of the year to get what they need. And so moving into Paradise Valley and then back and forth into Yellowstone is something that it seems that bison herds have probably done, as you said, I would say probably for about 10,000 years. And of course, we've had that huge depopulation of bison, and then we had the herds um, now that have grown again. And so we see this bison behavior that wildlife biologists are telling us about. So we, we can see that this movement into Paradise Valley was probably something that was very predictable and that local people knew. So then what's fascinating to us is that most of Paradise Valley is private land. Mm -hmm. So this is all um, north of the park, Yellowstone Park, up to Livingston. There's not a whole lot of land that's in the valley that is public. So a lot of the drive lines were initially mapped by an avocational archaeologist, I, I believe. Do you, is his name in that? Tom Jurdy. That's right. Yeah. So Tom Jurdy did a tremendous amount of work for decades getting to know all the local ranchers and people and making friends and talking about these parts of the landscape on their ranches where they would see rows of stacks of stone. And stone would be piled up into something like a cairn, something Mm -hmm. like you might see, but often bigger when it's something that we would say part of a drive line for a bison site. But these lines that we're seeing of cairns, you know, a, a, a jump site would often have two maybe somewhat parallel rows of these cairns that might lead f- upland in across sort of a flat plain that l- tips a little bit higher elevation before it has a steep drop off into a valley. Mm-hmm. And that, that if you could corral the bison through that, flanked on either side by these stone cairns, then the bison would be over the edge kind and super easy. Edge. Right. They might yeah. be breaking their legs, falling yeah. down, be easier to kill. So that would be a way that you could even siphon off part of a nursery herd if you got them spooked and moving. But in Paradise Valley, the maps of these lines of cairns, some of them go on for miles, but then they're all intersecting and bisecting. Some of them seem like they might have alignments with other things on the landscape. Scott Carpenter's paper really showed us what these line system looks like and what he was really focusing in on was the density yeah. of drive lines or lines of cairns of potential jump sites. So the emigrant jump is just probably right. one of many, many, many yeah. in the area. And that's one that's been well known since Barnum Brown was out here in like the 1920s or 1930s yeah. and mapped it. So I think what he's trying to figure out is how this relates to what Maria Nieva Zedeno yeah. and researchers up in the area outside Glacier and alongside of that High Line area have documented also tremendous amount of stonework. So people are creating circles. They're creating drive lines. They're creating effigies out of stone. They're creating a whole engineered landscape Mm -hmm. that holds meaning as well as holding maybe a practical utility for either corralling antelope yeah. and or bison right. so that it's not all bison jumps mm-hmm. there's all different ways to to use the landscape and i i think the main takeaway from Mir- maria nieva zedeno's work has been this requires a lot of labor yeah and it requires organization and planning yeah and we know people are mobile and they're on foot 
So you're carrying rocks. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you have a dog that could drag some of them. This is way before horses that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of these lines could have been on the landscape for a long time, effigies. So we have a layering. Scott's interested in trying to see, can we date these things using some new technologies? He's looking at LIDAR um, to try to map them better and to get a better sense of what's going on. There's so much we don't know yet. He's looking at what's going on in between the drive lines. Um, Mm -hmm. How far might the stone have been transported to make these cairns? Um, Other places we know farmers have moved stuff out of the way because they want to be able to plow fields and write. And so in in some parts of Montana, those drive lines are long gone and the cairns are long gone. But um, what the, the interesting takeaway is that we think there's a fairly complex amount of leadership, Mm -hmm. organization, something that's bringing people together in a coordinated way to get this labor done and Mm -hmm. and then also to maybe stake some claim over it. And so he wants to know what kind of population do we need of both people and perhaps bison and other animals. So there's a lot of interesting research and I think identifying multiple places in the high plains where we're seeing these crazy landscapes. Does he say in the abstract, I can't remember, how many miles of drive lines there well, were? Because I think he said something in the talk that yeah, was mind-blowing to It me. was, it was. But in the abstract, he says um, that they've documented the location of over 400 cultural rock alignments and features in Paradise Valley. So, but you know, these, like you said, some of these rock alignments go for miles. miles. So, so yeah. there's so, so I think he did, but he doesn't have it in the abstract. But um, it's, so he's really working to, um, follow up on Tom Jurdy's work and Tom Jurdy mapped a lot of these alignments or these rock cairns and these um, drive lines and so Scott is really working to GPS this information and to go back and, and to, and to yeah, double check to GPS Tom's work because Tom right. did it all in paper and pencil you know so back in the day back in the yeah. day and so um, Scott is going in and collecting GPS information for each feature each cairn each line, and then the slope and cross section of the, the driveway alleys, like you were talking about those drive line alleys. Um, he's also looking at the vegetation on the cairns and so many other details. So this is a really detailed, comprehensive look at these at this drive line system, which is going to be so informational and tell us so much eventually. So and it's complicated yeah. because it's not like it's all BLM land or all Forest Service land where you get one permit for your project, multi-year project, get a grant, get it done. These guys are out there trying to come at Mm -hmm. it where they've got to piece together permission from landowners they may not know yet. Tom Jordy knew a lot of these people. They're trying to get permissions. Then there's probably ways that they might be able to ask, could we fly a drone here or map yeah, this? Or just, so there's right. there's great new technology, but there's still a lot that has to be done. So it's very exciting research. And I think understanding that hunter-gatherers in the past that inhabited Montana, the ancestors of the tribes that are here today, um, they had very complex relationships mm-hmm. with the landscape, with the plants, with the animals. With there each was a other. Treme- right, yeah. a tremendous amount of knowledge. And so we're learning so much more about what life was like and why in certain places we see what almost looks like the beginnings of some um, of more complex behavior mm-hmm. and, and multi-year kind of staking out and investing in the landscape. Because if you've invested that much labor in creating maybe 400 drive lines, yeah. you're a tribe, then there's a certain amount of probably feeling of ownership you have over that territory, of course. So, yeah, right, so right. more to come on that. Yeah, so interesting. So let's move on and talk a little bit about um, a rock art presentation, which was really fascinating, and that was with um, that was with Carl Davis. So Carl Davis did a presentation um he did the presentation, but he wrote this paper with himself, James Kaiser, and Mark Willis. And the title was Rock Art Recording by Pole Assisted Aerial Photography at the No Bear Site. Right. So this is a really interesting um, rock art site that 
Carl Davis came to the Montana Archaeological Society a couple of years ago to ask for funding to help document this site because it was in danger. And so Carl Davis worked with the Blackfeet Nation to have this site recorded because it was on a panel. It was on a, um, a rock face, a sandstone rock face that was being undercut and kind of falling, kind of crumbling off the rock wall. And so he was worried, and a lot of other people, including the Blackfeet um, Cultural Committee, was worried that this rock was just going to fall off in a big chunk and you wouldn't be able to see the rock art that was on this panel any longer. So the Montana Archaeological Society Conservation Committee they fund projects like this, and they funded this project for Carl and his colleagues. And so um, whenever you do get funding from the Conservation Committee, though, you have to come back and present on what you did. And so that's kind of what this presentation was all about. So with that, I'll hand it off to you to do the heavy lifting on what this presentation was all about, Nancy. Well, what I remember <laughs> <laughs> is that... It was a very large panel, yeah, and it had, I believe, both petroglyphs and pictographs, and it was up very high in yeah. a place where you couldn't easily get to it, to draw it, to photograph it, to do anything. And so they really did need other techniques to be able to document it well, and then a lot of it had faded or was hard to see. Yeah. So they had to enhance the imagery with a lot of specific software that's been used a lot at rock art sites, de-stretch it, but others as well, in order to pull out the imagery so we could see the pictographs more clearly. And then I believe some of these underlying pecked figures. Right. And they had to get a big pole to get the the cameras up to the rock art area where the panel was because you couldn't see you couldn't see a lot of the rock art just with your blind eye from down below so right. so they they saw some rock art images up there they saw some imagery and they knew there was a rock art panel up there but when they got the pole up there with the cameras and they brought a gentleman to do this who's specialized in this work um, that's when they found so much more imagery than they had originally and thought was layers there layers of images yeah. so I mean, Crystal, some of that was like oh nothing gosh. I've ever seen. Yeah. I don't even know how to describe it. I hope that he publishes those images that they retrieved because yeah. there were some figures in red that were a little bit more familiar, but there's this upside down man, yeah. which was very prominent. And that's definitely something that the Blackfeet recognize and understand Though we don't have access to that meaning, that's right, fine. Right. But that's something that they um, recognize. Right. Um, there were other figures, other markings, but then the 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 very, I don't know. They're tall and skinny yeah. dancers, yeah. and they're clearly wearing headdresses yeah. and feathered headdresses that go down, and they seem to be moving into. I mean, there were beautiful but in an art style I have not seen in Montana, in Montana and I haven't yeah. really seen it other places and yeah. I know Carl was saying there must be more of this other places and we haven't necessarily connected it all yet but mm -hmm. I thought it was astonishingly beautiful yeah. and I, I think the other thing that always fascinates me is how these places become layered with imagery mm -hmm. Because yeah. they're clearly from different time periods, clearly by very different artists and different cultural groups. Right, right. right. Different, different people. Um, and over over many years, many, many years. And, and now, of course, archaeologists have named these traditions. And so some of this imagery was of the Foothills Abstract t Tradition, which really um, is motifs. Um, that might have been the work of religious figures. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's this other set of images that are from the vertical series, which is more of a communication system. So more, it's more communicating things about events and people who are partaking in those events. So there's just all these different aspects of communication happening on the same rock face, which I think is so interesting over time, right. over hundreds of years. And so so um, I do, like you, hope that Carl publishes this in Archaeology in Montana, which I'm sure he will, because it was um, it's hard to talk about what these figures look like on a podcast, but hopefully I'll get to see them because they were beautiful and amazing. Yeah, very, mm. very cool. Yeah. Um, 
Um, and I think this the, they were actually there to document a different site yeah. when they were found by the by it might have been the Oregon Archaeological Society yeah. with which James Kaiser works with a lot. And Carl walked off to sort of look around. I think he has this bit of a sixth sense, and he mm. and he looked up and and he found it. So he he was told by them, "You found it. You got to document it." Right. So he took it all the way home, which yeah. is great. So, in, in in collaboration with the Blackfeet Nation, yeah. which I love. I talked to the the Greers a little bit after yeah. that, and I asked Mavis, you know. Because I was so interested in Pictograph Cave and the the more than one hundred pictographs that are in that cave that date from all different time periods and that are of all different styles and traditions and I and I said this layering is so fascinating to me and why do you think it is that people come back to those particular places those panels rather than going to an, a different place or would they have you know, I don't know. I I don't feel like it's necessarily something that in my cultural context, if I saw imagery on a wall somewhere, whether mm-hmm. it was in an alley or somewhere, that I would then draw over it, draw mm-hmm. on it, even if mm-hmm. it had faded. And um, her answer from having done decades of Yeah, she's the research, for, her and her husband, John yes. Greer, are the foremost experts in rock art in, the, in this region. They're amazing. Yeah. And all throughout Wyoming. Yeah. And so they said that they feel like, oh, if a place already has imagery, then it's recognized as a place of power. Mm -hmm. And so you add to it and you go to it and you're drawn to it. And so her feeling was that was what was going on with Pictograph Cave. It was already marked. And so you just kept coming back to it, even if it was a decade before, a century before, a millennia before, people would there. That tradition is something that was kind of recognized all throughout the plains, and clearly in the southwest and other places too. So, wow. yeah, I know. I thought that was really interesting. That's so interesting. So, hopefully, more on that. We should have Carl back on to talk about I that know, site, right? Yeah, yeah. So. So anyway, now I want to talk about also a presentation that was done by Mike Neely and yourself, Nancy. So you not only presented with me about the podcast, but then you also presented on a a site that you um, excavated. Uh, What year was that that you guys were out there excavating? Well, it was right before the pandemic. I so believe it was 2019. Okay. Mm-hmm. And we were going to go the back summer. in 2020, and then that, that was a no-go. Yeah. So um, this paper was by Michael Neely and yourself, Nancy Mahoney, and it's titled Archaeology and Community Outreach, the 2019 MSU Field School in Judith Gap, Montana. So I'm just going to let you talk a little bit about this, since you are the, the person who did it. <laughs> well, Mike and I were... Fortunate enough to be given access to a bison kill site on private land. It hadn't been recorded before. You went out there with me early, early on when we got the phone call. call, um, And we went out to see the site and found out that a gentleman named James Bergstrom, who lives um, a little bit over, had had sort of rented that land for a number of years, maybe five, ten years, and one day discovered a a gopher burrow hole where some large bones were eroding out. And he discovered the bison kill site that way. And he did some digging around with the landowner's permission, who was out of the country and, and had given his blessing to that. So James had a lot of information for us about where he dug and had a whole collection that he shared with us so that we could document what he had collected from that. So Mike and I took that information. We filled out and documented a site so that it's it's on file with the SHPO. And then we went State, ahead. State Historic Preservation Office. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> so you can see it found. It's called now the, the Bergstrom Bison Kill. And we could see from the the other digging that had happened from James and community members that it was definitely a bison kill site, that there was a tremendous amount of bison bone coming out of there. And a lot of the points that were coming out were these beautiful, symmetrical, very thin points that are called Avonlea points. And they date to a certain time period about a thousand years ago. And there were also some points that were thicker, that are chunkier and bigger, and they um, not as symmetrical, sometimes made out of different materials. Those are basant points, and they may have been used on adult adel darts. Mm. Um, so they probably came from a slightly earlier time period, and so two different hunting technologies, but mm. the same place, the same wow. bison kill site. So we um, 
decided to put together a field school. We had about eight students. Mm-hmm. We went to Judith Gap, and they gave us two houses that we could stay in rent-free. Wow. And we crammed everybody in, and we um, then did a four-week field season where we put in – Wow, maybe, I can't remember how many test units, 15 Mm -hmm. or so, and it was an amazing amount of bison bone that we recovered. Jack Fisher came up, visited the site. We got a lot of bison jaws that we hope will tell us something about seasonality for some of the time periods. We recovered diagnostic points from all different levels, but then most importantly, we were able to get some radiocarbon dates, and we were able to retrieve some obsidian, and we were able to source the obsidian. So the radiocarbon Mm -hmm. dating was also paid for by a grant from oh, yeah. the MAS, the Archaeological Society's Conservation Committee, and that was wonderful yeah. because they told us that we did indeed have an Avonlea phase that dated to about a 1,000 years ago and then nice. an earlier phase that dated to this Basant phase. And we were able to find also a different area of the site that hadn't been uncovered before where there was a stream running alongside of the the kill site and on a little outcropping of land down slope there was what looked to be sort of a one event either mm. corralling or driving and kill where we had only basant points mm. only radiocarbon dates that were earlier dating to that time period and interestingly the obsidian from the earlier phase was all coming i believe from Idaho Okay. And all of the later phase, Avon Lee, was all coming from Obsidian Cliff and Yellowstone. Wow. So either trade networks yeah. or the people and their procuring networks changed over <laughs> the, the time that this site was being used. And it's interesting because Judith Gap is in this almost dead center of Montana. Definitely a great place it's to just hunt this bison. Little, yeah, yeah. It, oh, it's a, a beautiful place. Beautiful place. Beautiful. Great. It would have been a yeah. great place to hunt bison, yeah. but it also isn't necessarily what historically any of the tribes um, and ethno historically would have called sort of their central home, but it's a place that a lot of them claim as, as hunting grounds that they periodically came to. So it was probably a place that was used by many, many different ancient groups of people over time, oh, over yeah. over more than a thousand years. Mm-hmm. So a lot of information already learned, but we're still doing the analysis on the bones. And um, we just had such a great relationship with the community. All yeah. of the school kids came out. Um, one of the school teachers at the end of the school year came out and dug at the site with us mm-hmm. and ran, you know, ran the screen. We had a lot of visitors and it was a wonderful experience. And we were, we were sorry that the pandemic cut off our second season. Right, right. But, you know, I think that just really showcases the community community support of this archaeological field school because they gave you the housing for free and you guys went and ate at the restaurant, the one restaurant in Judith right. Gap every night and they loved you and went the last night um, – Mike showed a, a slide or a picture of the sandwich board that said, thank you, I miss you, a field school will miss you guys, or something like that. Like we really like dug having yeah. you yeah, here. Yeah, we dug the dug, you, you know, And yeah. it, was, it was very, it was really cute. And we were the talk of the town. You people are. always wanted to ask us what we were finding. We yeah. would invite them to the site. Yeah. And then people started also sharing information about sites that right. were on their land. So it was a, a really wonderful experience. There hadn't been any archaeology really done in the area. Again, it's all private land. And um, it was the first time we could really get to know people better face to face. So it yeah. was a great experience, and the students were wonderful. And it's really that that connection between the university and the rural community, you know. And I think that there's sometimes some disconnect between those two things. And so you guys connected it, and and those people are probably sending their students to MSU because they're like, oh right. yeah, remember. 2019, those I MSU know professors David were out here, and they're the so cool. landowner, he, yeah. he called us up because he was a bobcat. He had yeah. gotten his agricultural degree 
um, at MSU. Yeah. And so I think, Crystal, you and I will probably head back this summer yeah. and we'll do a presentation of the findings yeah. there and bring back some artifacts and talk to the community about what they might want to do yeah. with this information and if they would like the landowner would like back the artifacts or right. if maybe the community wants to display them. So we have a lot more to do with that. So that more well. updates to come on yeah. that one. So so that kind of rounds out the presentations we wanted to talk about that we heard and listened to. Oh, and we did do our presentation, too, on the podcast, which is really great. We did. We did a nice <laughs> presentation because we wanted the Archaeological Society to know, because some individual members knew because they've been on it. Yeah. But we wanted them to know that this is a, a wonderful way for research to get out to the public. And, of course, it came out of the pandemic like so many things. Yeah. But um, – we did start off our <laughs> presentation making fun of ourselves because we have been compared to the Women on the Delicious Dish, which is the fictitious program of Saturday Night Live, yeah. where sweaty balls and dusty muffins were talked about yeah. by Alec Baldwin and Betty White. Yeah. And so we did a little intro and um, people thought it was great because they uh, – they compare us. <laughs> they do <laughs> to the ladies <laughs> who make fun of themselves on that show. So that was great. That was fun. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was great fun. It was a it was a great time to be able to talk about the podcast and and during the podcast presentation, I I asked people to raise their hands if yeah. they'd ever listened to the Dirt on the Past, and so many hands went up. It I was, was nice so excited. To see. It so was great. To that see. was wonderful. Yeah, yeah. So um, then we just want to kind of finish finish the podcast today, kind of wrap things up by talking about um, the awards that were given at the presentation because, or at the conference, because every year there are awards given. And this year, I, I just loved that an award was given to Ann Johnson, and it was a Lifetime Achievement Award. And Ann Johnson has been um, a part of Montana Archaeological Society from the very beginning. And as you mentioned earlier, she was part of that Milk River Society. Um, and she's been doing archaeology since she was in her 20s. And she got a, she, she's, she started as an avocational, of course, but then she became a professional. She got her degree in anthropology. And then she worked at Yellowstone National Park for many years. Decades. Decades. Yeah. And she has been the editor of the Archaeology and Montana magazine or journal for the last 30 plus years and she just retired from that that volunteer gig yeah, <laughs> so yeah. and so um so the Montana Archaeological Society awarded her with the lifetime achievement for all the, the work that she has done for the Montana Archaeological Society and I was so glad to see her get that award um I love Ann Johnson so much, and I think that she's she's been a real role model for women archaeologists through the years, of course, and a role model for me, and I'm sure a role model for you, Nancy, and so many other women who have come up through the society. So it's just so great to see her get that award. Yeah, she has given so much to the the society, and she holds so much knowledge about it, its history, and, Monta and she's seen it go through many changes, and being able to put out that Archaeology in Montana Journal twice a year, every year, to get articles, to mm -hmm. make sure they're edited, to get them printed and published um, is is such a feat. It's it's not easy. It's not cheap. No. And then get them all mailed out to everybody. She's mm -hmm. done a remarkable job. Yeah. yeah. And so the new editor of Archaeology in Montana is Sarah Scott. And so she is taking it on and has big shoes to fill, but we know she can do that very easily. So we're excited about that as well. Yes. Yeah. So anything else you wanted to say, Nancy? I think that's about all we wanted to talk about. I think that's uh, the highlights for yeah. now. That's a lot for people to think about. And hopefully in the future, people might decide to just show up and hear about some of these interesting projects. If they want to come, anybody can come. You just join and show up to the meetings. Yeah. And you can – there's social hours that often happen. Sometimes there's live auctions and then there's a, a keynote speaker. So there's lots of different aspects of the Archaeological Society meetings that – are wonderful if if anybody any member of the public wants to come that's interested yeah. yeah yeah and we just wanted to thank the montana archaeological society again for sponsoring this podcast episode and if you'd like to become a member of the montana archaeological society which we 
highly encourage, um, and it's very inexpensive to become a member. I don't know what the dues are, but it's like $35 or something. Very cheap. So um, just go to the website. The Montana Archaeological Society website is mtarchaeologicalsociety.org, and you can easily sign up. So with that, we just wanted to thank everybody for listening to our overview of, the, of our experiences at the Montana Archaeological Society meeting. And so if you love this podcast, please tell a friend and make sure to hit the little subscribe button at the top of the podcast so it shows Or at a, the bottom of the podcast. Or, the, or leave a review at the bottom. Oh, yeah. that's what it yeah. is. Because okay. yeah. we couldn't find it there we for a little bit. We couldn't find it for a you know, while. We're telling all these people to, <laughs> to leave review. a review and, and we're like, I don't even know how to do that. And then we had to figure out how to leave a review, but we did it. We did. We did. You you scroll all the way on Spotify anyway. You scroll all the way to the bottom, and then you can leave a review. And we encourage, we highly encourage you to do that. So, and then on Apple, it's the same deal. You just scroll to the bottom, and you can leave a review. So, thanks so much for listening today, and we hope you can join us again to find out more about. The The Dirt dirt on the the Past. past. And thank you again to the Montana Archaeological Society for sponsoring this episode. A big thank you to our editors, Drake Pinnell and Sierra Thomas. Thanks to Lawson Alegria for mixing the music and to Steve Durbin at KGVM and John Chadwell for help getting the podcast out into the world. (laughs) 